Welcome to episode four of the Time Expansion Project. I'm John K. Coyle, and in this series, as always, we're going to dig into the neuroscience and psychology of time perception, and very specifically, I will teach you by the end of the series how to slow, stop, and reverse the perceived acceleration of time that most adults feel and experience the endless summers of youth again. Uh, last time, I was digging into some credentialing in my history of the sport. Um, I didn't really finish that, so I would like to sort of continue with the fact that I spent, you know, 15, 18 years on U.S. national teams in speed skating and cycling, chasing tiny increments of time, which could fundamentally change my trajectory as a human. Uh, I was fortunate to win the silver medal in the Olympics. I'll show that maybe next time. It's somewhere in this room, I think. Um, and so that was a big step forward. Like, that's a gift that still keeps giving. But uh, the reality is, as I exited sport, age 30, first real job, my next job was literally at Goldman Sachs, spending an entire year, and we were working like 78 hours, an entire year, 2,000 people spent an entire year, 2,000 man years to create one second. So 2,000 man years of effort to make the clocks at Goldman Sachs go from 1231.99 to 0101.00 Y2K. So that was my very, very first job. Life sort of centered around time with Goldman Sachs, and I was very confused about the way time was speeding up, and that whole year sort of disappeared into nothing despite working crazy hours. And then my very next project was, was for four years, spent with Enron. Yes. Uh, I think my number one claim to fame in my Forrest Gump way is I'm the only person on the planet to have worked directly for Jeff Skilling and Ken Lay of Enron and cycled on the same team as Lance Armstrong, arguably the two greatest frauds perpetuated in modern mankind. Now I'm in my early 30s and every summer is getting faster and I'm not liking it. I didn't like it at all and I was just like not okay with this and I started getting really obsessed. And so I started reaching out. And the first email and info call I made was to, rest in peace, Dr. Phil Zimbardo of Stanford who passed a few months ago. He's written several books on time, they call him Father Time, some people do. Uh, I had him in my Psych 101 and 102 class. He had a whole couple of lectures on time perception and so this is probably where he probably sparked my interest in time and so I, I got a hold of him actually and I was like, listen, you know, Dr. Z, like, time seems to be speeding up the older I get. Feels like every summer's shorter than the last. Like, what's going on? He's like, well, it's true across all cultures and all, all geographies and 98% of adults feel this. And then, you know, there's, and then I was like, well, so, you know, what do we do about it? How do we make it go counterclockwise? And his answer was, well, well nobody's done that recently. And I was like, ding, 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 sign me up. Like, I am in, put me in coach. Like, I'm gonna figure this out. I didn't know if I could figure it out, but you know, with my history and design thinking, tackling difficult problems, I thought, all right, maybe there's a way. So I start calling around. And so I eventually, over the years, I got in touch with a bunch of really amazing experts. And uh, so I've been fortunate to been able to interrogate David Kelly and Tom Kelly of Stanford, who David Kelly was my academic advisor in college. So that, that wasn't that. One of the next calls a few years later was Stephen Kotler, um, Rise of Superman, an expert in flow states. Uh, Daniel Coyle, uh, The Talent Code, spent a lot of time talking with him. Uh, probably the most time with David Eagleman and Moran Cerf. David Eagleman from PBS's The Brain, probably, in my opinion, the world's leading expert in the neuroscience of time perception. He's done all kinds of experiments and he's constantly tinkering with how humans experience time. And Moran Cerf was sort of the whisperer to the stars for Hollywood, having, I think, uh, contributed physics. He's a PhD from Caltech, a neuroscientist, a uh, PhD neuroscientist from Caltech, uh, super crazy smart. Um, contributor to Hollywood for, I think, Inception, Interstellar, Gravity, all movies that have to do with physics and time and things. But first, some bad news. I will have to figure out how to put a graph in this video, but uh, my obsession sort of grew to fruition a number of years ago, and I, I started realizing, and I saw some graphs, and I'll show those later uh, from this uh, German philosopher guy, but that the notion that, that time ex exponentially increases the older you get, and I think that's the way it feels, right? And so I started graphing my life, and at the time I made this graph, I was 43 years old, and I did the death clock and other things, and I filled out my actuarial data in various insurance forms, and it turns out that somebody my height, my weight at age 43, my life expectancy 
at that time, I won't tell you how long ago that was, but at the time, at age 43, was 86, so it's exactly half done. So according to the actuarial tables of somebody height and weight, I was half done. And so, you know, I don't know what your age is when you're looking at this, but I'm gonna guess my audience will be between 30 and 50 probably. And so you're, you're somewhere in the middle. And you might say to yourself, okay, so we're half done. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We said, we have said from the beginning that life only accelerates, that 98% of adults feel that a time is accelerating the older they get. And so this notion that you're half done is completely misguided. And when you start to plot it differently and you start to think about a summer as an eight-year-old lasting nearly forever, I can't plot that, starts to feel a lot like a year as a 20-something, which is when time accelerates for most people, starts to feel like a decade in middle age. Oof. When you plot that curve, the area under that curve is not half done. It's literally a tiny sliver. It's this sliding scales where you've got a little, tiny little bit left. And so when we plot that logarithmically, which I think is an appropriate way to do it, we find out that from a time experience storage retrieval mechanism way of thinking, you're not half done at 43, you're actually half done at 18. Life is half over at 18. And when you're 43, you're 92% done. Life is 92% done, the fat lady is singing, the bell is tolling, we are at the end. Is anybody horrified besides me? Well, you should be. You should be. Because the way the brain works, the laziness it inherits, the, the routines we establish, the safety we've established, causes the brain to stop writing, storing, and recalling things. And that's the death of you. If you ever found yourself in the parking lot and you didn't know how you got there, that's because the brain said, I'm not writing this down. And I make a great argument that you're dead in those minutes. If you didn't write it down, if you didn't store it, and if you can't recall it, you weren't alive. That's just facts, in my opinion, Facts, opinion, it's my opinion, but I believe it's based in facts. If you didn't write it down, you didn't store it, and you can't recall it, then you weren't alive. Don't we wanna be alive? So how do we be alive? We have to write, store, and recall memories. In order to do that, we've gotta trick the brain into doing it, and the older we get, the lazier it wants to be. But eight-year-olds, eight-year-olds are damn good at it. Well, they don't have a choice. So in the next lecture, we're gonna dig into that. Um, but for now, I'm going to leave you with the exact same thing that I told you again and again. And by the way, I will teach you how to live not 43 more years, but 430. I am already close to a year into 2025. It has been eight days. Eight days into 2025, and it feels like a year for me. Uh, sadly, my father's birthday was today, and he passed a year ago, a year and a month ago. Um, and so, you know, there's been a bunch of events actually in the last year that have added to my memory storage and recall. Um, not all of them good. And that's, that's the deal, right? Like it's not always the best moments that lead to memory recall and storage. Um, but you have to take the risk to get the reward. So I'm going to show you how to reverse that curve. I will leave you as always with the notion that the value of an increment of time is not related to its duration. We'll see you in the next episode. Hi, thanks for watching episode four. Coming soon will be uh, an inside the episode with a TBD expert, could be David Eagleman or Moran Surf or somebody else um, lining those up now. But if you liked what you saw here, can you please subscribe and share? And I'll put the button up uh, left, I think. And also the next episode will appear in the screen right about here. And if you have thoughts, comments, questions, if there's a topic you'd like me to cover, put that in the comments as well. And I'll look forward to seeing you next time. All right, thanks, bye.